Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com. Um, it's been done probably almost ad nauseum over the last few days. Spoiler alert, I was gonna, I'm was going i going to do a review of Better Call Saul Season 6 and really the whole thing. Cause I've done a couple, I think like podcasts, I've talked about Better Call Saul, Breaking Bad. So, I mean, it was, you know, a few days ago. It's not like it just happened. Um, so... I mean, I was a Breaking Bad fan, starting with the second season. I was I actually dated someone who introduced me both to Breaking Bad and to Why the Last Man. It's interesting enough. But, um, yeah, the um, I got into it, you know, pretty early on. And it wasn't my favorite show, but pretty damn close. I mean, I, I couldn't help but just get sucked in and loved it. Um, and then when... Breaking Bad was finally coming to a close. Um, you know, I think it made Brian Cranston like sort of iconic in a lot of ways. I had known him from How I Met Your Mother. The funny thing is, he was him and Bob Odenkirk both were on How I Met Your Mother. Bob Odenkirk, I believe, played Barney's boss, and Brian Cranston played Ted's boss. Um, of course, he had been on um, Brian Cranston had been on Malcolm in the Middle, but anyway, it was coming to a close. You know, they the last season they stretched out into two halves and everything. That was kind of a big year. It was like the course of almost a full year, I think. I don't think it was six months. I forget. It was like August of 20... It was like almost 10 years ago when that ended. It was August of 2013 or September. But they talked about how... Yeah, well, they're going to... They're thinking of doing a... a like a prequel or spinoff for the Saul character. And Saul... The Saul character, I always really liked. I mean, that that character, like Brian... Like Walt character, kind of made Brian Cranston iconic. Um, yeah, in a lot of ways, the Saul character just on Breaking Bad brought Bob Odenkirk's name. I mean, he was a known sort of comedian, stand-up comedy writer, per se, and been on some, some shows, some sketch comedy shows, Mr. Show specifically. Um, he worked on the Ben Stiller show. Anyway, before that, but, you know, he's like, who is that guy, Bob Odenkirk? You know, oh, that's Saul, you know, and everyone thought of him for Saul, but, um... The initial, like, speculation, rumor, gossip, and even, like, maybe in an interview or two about it was it was going to be, like, a sitcom. Because the Saul Goodman character, of course, in Breaking Brad is portrayed as someone who is, like, this this lawyer that <laughs> gets people basically off for nothing. That do that criminals, you know, from small to big crime, you know, especially. Um, he's a defense attorney, kind of, or, or in litigation, you know. Um, fighting for the bad guy in some ways, or maybe proving the bad guy isn't bad based on the law. You know, it was, it was very comedic, but he was very witty and charming and a, a fast talker. And um, but it, it really seemed like it would lend to being sort of a sitcom. We got to see we're we're gonna maybe see what Saul Goodman's work was with outside of his work with um, Walter and um, Jesse and the. And Gus and the whole um, cartel and the meth, the meth trade, that kind of thing, that whole world. Uh, the other criminals he's helping, and it would be a prequel. So we see how he became that way. Which that's what Better Call Saul was, but in a different way. It turned out to, we, we do it more in a dramatic fashion, the way he sort of became this character. Um, although throughout Better Call Saul, as it's been noted. You don't really see Jimmy McGill or, or Bob Walker play the the Saul Goodman character as he is in Breaking Bad at all. Like, even as the closest period time frame, the episode before Kim breaks up with with him, um, and a couple scenes, I mean, really, the, the scenes in the, the Saul, or in the uh, Jimmy McGill time frame, which is like, that's the thing I'm still kind of struggling a little bit with. 2003, 2004. He never really... Even at the, 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 the furthest, he never really kind of resembled exactly what he was in Breaking Bad. Now, of course, the biggest intrigue when they launched Better Call Saul was... Um, they showed the what in effect was the flash forward in, in black and white. And, of course, at the end of Breaking Bad, Saul's... The, the, the police and the, you know, the, the feds were going to be after him, um, so he has to do the whole disappearing thing, which that was really, 
for the most part, that's the first time we actually got to find out about that. Because previous episodes, previous seasons, in Breaking Bad, Saul Goodman had mentioned, I know a guy who knows a guy, in effect, and it's something where you, you change identities and that kind of thing. You pay him a lot of money. Um, but... You know he's he's gonna have to just like Brian like Brian like just like the Walt character has to at one point in the last season of Breaking Bad, um, and then in the finale the series finale of Better Call Saul of course they you see Brian there's a scene that was put in there with with Walter and and Saul in there waiting for the vacuum guy uh, Robert Forster's character vacuum cleaner store guy that's gonna disappear them waiting for them to get all their information so that they can go off. I think Walter goes to, I think it's like upstate New York, which is like way further away. I don't know, it's a long drive. I don't know if we even saw them. I can't remember that episode of Breaking Bad. See him actually traveling, I think it's on a bus, maybe, to that part. I mean, that's nowhere near New Mexico. Whereas Saul ends up going and turn, becomes Gene. I don't remember what Walter White's alias was. I, I have to go back and watch it now. I really should if I have the time, but... Um, but he becomes Gene Takovic and goes to Omaha. And he made that line, he had that famous line that they kept on referencing toward the end of Better Call Saul with Francesca, like the last couple seasons. You know, I'll if you need me, I'll be you'll you'll find me, you may be able to find me at a at a Cinnabon in in Omaha. Um which he does, which in the flash forwards in Better Call Saul was always showing in black and white, you know, Saul now is Gene in that with a mustache and glasses. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, um, but anyway, so you see the whole, you see, you see what happened to him, but not in full. And that was always what was the most intriguing thing. To I think my, a lot of fans felt that way. Watching Better Call Saul is what ha We want to know what happened to Saul after Breaking Bad. And it was just like little snippets, little breadcrumbs, teasing of what really, until we got the last really the last half of season um, season six. I mean, I knew they were going to have... They did one full episode in that, that period. Actually, a couple of them, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I'll just get it out of the way. Just going to babble on for already long enough. My overall take on the finale and the sort of how the show ends is that Jimmy, Saul, Gene are at peace. He's, you know, a con man. He's gone through all these, trans done all these trans transgressions, gotten away with figuratively and in some ways almost literally murder. Not actually, but um, it caught up with him and it, it really seemed like in some cases, like the, the scene where he's, um, the whole situation where he sort of gets caught, he almost wanted to get caught when he was at um, Kevin, Kevin Sussman, you know, Stewart from Brit, from the Big Bang Theory's character's house, he could just go in there, take the photos, and get out, but he doesn't. And the fact he didn't even, was able to do the trick with, uh, I mean, yeah, he had cancer, and he wasn't like some of the other ones in that sort of ruse, in that con they were doing with those other guys that were, you know, these rich jerks, basically, In I mean, in some ways deserved to have their identity taken, I mean, it's morally that's he was kind of a, that's what Saul Goodman Jimmy McGill Gene Takovic in small parts really was is like he's basically trying to play moral god or he's trying to like Robin Hood in some ways he's want to set things to be fair from his perspective I think going back in the series with his his approach to like getting his law degree and seeing his brother and his approach to his brother he's trying to sort of even the score with his brother and showing him yeah, I can do this. I'll do it my way. In some ways, it's better than your way. Uh, it was always always trying to sort of compare himself, live up to compare himself to his brother, and see seeing that he felt like he was just as smart in different ways than his brother, because his brother was a genius in terms of law. Um, but um, and I think actually the first three seasons of Better Call Saul, thinking back at it, seeing some of the old clips and the references and stuff with Michael McKeon really made that show more than what I think it was expected. And I mean, I know people have talked about the last few seasons, which were all great too, but I mean like the Nacho character, the way Nacho ends up at the end of Better Call Saul was kind of satisfying in a way. Although watching the scene, I still kind of wonder if he actually did actually die, but, um, yeah, and, and some of the other characters, I mean, 
I think Lalo, the Lalo character and the way he dies was fitting in a way with Gus, the Gus kind of, but I, I was hoping that it, it could have been a little more sort of, not dramatic, but just kind of like the two going at it and then have some other peripheral characters involved too. And then having more speeches. I mean, there was some speech work, but it, there, there seemed to be more. The problem with that was in the perspective when Gus does take out Lalo, um, it would have been nice to have seen Hector, you know, um, there as well, or knowing about that sort of as a revenge thing. Because Hector, you know, from the point that he was introduced in Better Call Saul, I mean, I mean Breaking Bad was further, the whole thing with um, Tuco and everything like that, which that, that remains probably my favorite episode of the whole universes when Jesse and Walt are being basically kidnapped by Tuco and you have Hector there in the wheelchair and the but um I would have liked to have seen you know Hector's reaction because when he, he saw his reaction is just pure gold when he sees what what Nacho does um you know in the scene that in la, the last Nacho scene uh his but you know because that was the whole thing is well Lalo's gonna get you I'm gonna get Lalo to get you and he doesn't you couldn't get Gus to sort of go off and give a like a like a rant or a diatribe at Lalo at some of the other people, Don Eladio, some of the other characters because of the perspective of the time frame. That was two thousand three or two thousand four, I guess. And of course, we learn about Gus's fate later in Breaking Bad, and that's four or five years later or whatever. So that's part of the issue. They kind of the the, the circumstance of making Better Call Saul as a prequel in the time frame, but um, but I, I feel like. Saul and, or Jimmy, Saul, Jimmy really, and Kim, which Kim is a beloved character, I'll talk a little bit about her in a minute, have found peace to an extent. That's what my reaction is. While they didn't ride off into the sunset, I always wondered or kind of hoped in a way that the two of them would have like ended up going off to Canada with new identities and being pro bono lawyers. That would have been sort of, because that was kind of the thing, helping people that need the help that can't afford the help or can't get the help because they deserve it, you know. Um, that's kind of my, my feeling, my approach to Kim especially, and I think Jimmy to an extent, that's maybe part of their bond is that, you know, the legal system and this whole thing with HHM and a bunch of just blood-sucking lawyers, as they say, and, you know, money-hungry, and, um, they don't really understand the sort of perspective of these people that are trying to be being accusing convicted of crimes when they really don't deserve it necessarily, um... And they, they could have done it maybe not in Canada, maybe in Europe. I don't know. That would have been a cop-out. It would have been... I don't know, because they still would have had to live with the guilt. And that's why I felt like maybe they ended it the best way they could with them getting the guilt and the sort of self-conscious... You know, as opposed to Aaron... Aaron, Aaron Paul. Jesse Pinkman, who at the end of El Camino goes off to Alaska, I guess it is, and has a different identity. Now, you can say, well, a lot of the stuff he ended up doing later in Breaking Bad... He was pretty much had no choice. He was forced to do, in effect. Um, but he still was guilty of a lot. And so, I don't know. He has to live with it. You know, if they ever dig it up and do another thing in the in the, this Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul universe, that might be addressed. I kind of doubt it because I know what Vince Gilligan was in. I read an interview with him the night after the finale saying that he doesn't want to sort of beat a dead horse. And you see these other types of universes, you know, franchises that just won't let go and they keep going on for too long or they keep on doing spin-off after spin-off and it never ends. And um, I can I can follow that. I, I, I can see why people wouldn't... I can see why he would say that because it's like, let it be, let it just remember it the way it is. But let's give it some time, you know? I don't know, certain shows, if, you know, like they might bring Battlestar Galactica back or do a reboot. I hope they don't do a reboot, but I could see at some point... Well, after a lot of time has passed, it could be 10 or 20 years from now, or it could just be five years from now. I don't know. They could end up doing some kind of related story. The, the Gus one is the one that I was thinking might almost, if they did like a prequel series for him, because we didn't learn that much about his sort of, he was in Chile and stuff like that. You could do like a young Gus, you know. Um, I don't know. A young Fring or something like that. Um... It would, you know, the thing is, would would Gil, when Vince and and uh, Peter Gould be behind it? They would be like just executive producers or something. I don't know. I mean, I know that Vince Gilligan. There's talk about he's doing, he's he's writing. Or there's writing. This is like earlier this year, before Better Call Saul, the, the season premiere had come on. He was he's been writing stuff for a new series. I don't know if it's been picked up or anything, but um, 
I'm curious about that. I mean, I wasn't really an X-Files fan, but you just look at what he did with these two shows, his style of sort of dramedy, you know, dark drama, you know, dark drama with black comedy, and these characters, especially if you get the right actors, you have Bob Odenkirk, Ray Seahorn, Brian Cranston, Aaron Paul, you have to have great actors still to be able to have the show and the quality of the, the show and the, the performance and the, what you come across and the story uh, still be as as good as it, as it is. That's part of why what made these two shows so successful. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the Kim character became more and more, you know, important, liked, appreciated. Although that whole thing about her when she was going to leave Jimmy because she has a moral compass more than he did. And she, you know, but then the whole thing about, well, we never see her in Breaking Bad. Where the hell were she? Is she dead? Everyone wondered if she was going to die. But then the more I thought about it, it was about three or four months ago, toward the beginning of the first season, I thought, how would, he, how would you know, Saul or Jimmy be, be so, like, of the personality and chipper and, like, sarcastic and witty and all that stuff, or dressing the way he is if Kim dies, knowing that Kim dies. Now, given the transformation that he made, and even that, that scene, it's like the third to last episode... The scene we, where we see, yeah, the flashback, where you, it was the second to last episode, it was the, the penultimate, if they've been calling it. That scene in, in his office is just, that was hard to take. You're watching basically Jimmy saying, you know, have a nice life, you know, I don't care about you anymore. It's like, that, the bond of Kim and, 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 and Jimmy is like the strongest part of the show, and he's like, they'd always be, they'd always at least be at, be at, on the same side for the most part they wouldn't any fights would get resolved they would never lose that connection even if they left each other like kim said you know we're, we're bad for each other we're poison um but it, that almost spoke to being like he's completely changed changed character which he i guess had and that would explain why we didn't hear about her however um there was some underlying part about him that over time after he was separated from that life later as gene takovic and he was depressed he kind of i think he he kind of made up for that. The whole thing he called her over and stuff, that was just to get her to, to him, him give the speech and stuff in the hearing. Um, I was a little down about the fact that you saw him, and this kind of teaches me a lesson about IMDB.com. The, the, the Price character, um, Daniel Wormsland or whatever, uh, Mark Prox was listed for a few different episodes toward the end of the show, and he didn't show up, I don't think, at all. The guy who played, who was the baseball card guy, the Probably the funniest character in the first season. Um, that was a little of a downer, you know. Do it. They should do a show on him. I, I guess there was some talk as he did. He laundered, he laundered money like he was going to with like a like an um, not a, a video game, an arcade um, laser tag, like a laser tag, you know, studio or you know whatever you want to call it, you know, course. He put supposedly when when Saul got all this money from largely from the whole cartel meth trade with Walter and um, he had money, but he he had to find a way to, to launder it, just like Walt had to do it with the the laundry business, uh, ironically or whatever. Because um, then there's a scene in better in Breaking Bad with uh, Saul and and Walter in the car, and he mentions. You need a Danny, you know, and he's referring to Daniel Wormsland, I think. That's what people said. The speculation, some of the uh, the vivid wiki, Vicky Kiwi or whatever his name is, mentioned that on his his Better Call Saul video, one of his Better Call Saul videos. So, a little, a little down about that. I, was, I saw him on IMDb. It just goes to show you can't trust IMDb fully, you know. I was pretty certain that Kim was going to come back after we didn't see her after the, was it the fourth the last episode? Something like that. They just had, they couldn't not address her. So, um... But I mean, it ends. You know, I think the two of them are at peace. He's at, He's in prison, of course. He seems to be kind of supported or respected and liked in prison, even though it's prison. He had the whole plea bargain down to seven years. We had, of course, Betsy Brandt, you know, who plays um, Hank's widow and Gomi's widow. Widow. You didn't have Skyler, of course. There. You didn't have. Um, there's a couple other characters. I was thinking. You also didn't fully get a resolution or understanding of what happens to. Mike's um, daughter-in-law and granddaughter. Now I'd have to go back to watch the end of Breaking Bad. Remember when Mike Mike dies, of course. But I would have thought they're still around. They could have revisited. I mean, again, some of it's fan service. Bringing Walt Jesse back, at least half to, half of that was 
largely to do with fan service. Even bringing Hank and Gomi back in that episode a couple seasons, like season five, I think it was, some of it's fan service. I mean, it's, it, there's no question about that. But, I don't know, I have to look it up and look on like the Breaking Bad fandom wiki or whatever. Because, um, you know, they were in the show. Of course, Mike does die. He gets shot by Walt. Um, but what happens to the two of them? I mean, you know, Mike is one of the characters that can't be overlooked. He, I always liked his character. In fact, if I chose one character I liked the most throughout the whole, you know, universe at this point, Mike is probably it. So, anyway. But that's about it for it. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Uh, just to add a few more comments, because I kind of got rushed at the end when I just when I just talked about it. I'm going to chop this and add this chop put this onto the end of that video. As far as Better Call Saul goes and sort of the canon of television, I mean, Breaking Bad, like I said, they're not my favorite shows, but it's hard to argue they, you know, shows are better than them. Um, especially with the sort of comic relief that the writers would always put in there, different pop culture references and stuff like that. Um, I mean... Part of it also, like, I have nostalgia for it, like I was talking about Breaking Bad. I have nostalgia for Better Call Saul, especially in the early days. And first of all, they introduced Michael McKeon, of course, from people know best, maybe, well, from a lot of roles, the, like, this is Spinal Tap and, um, let's see, Best in Show, a lot of those movies. But then the Christopher Guest stuff. But, of course, he was, uh, from Lenny and Squiggy from Laverne and Shirley. Um, it's the same guy. I mean, the guy has a great career. He should get some sort of lifetime achievement thing with the Emmys. I mean, he was really good as Chuck. I mean, you know, he was a character you you found entertaining. He was very quirky and very eccentric. Eccentric was like the best way to describe him. But you like to see him play this character, even though the character was like a different kind of character from like maybe anything I've ever seen him do. But um, and I haven't seen nearly all his stuff, of course, but um, but when he was gone, it's like, they kind of compensated, they did more with Kim, and some of the other, like Howard, of course. Um, I always thought that Ted Beneke and Howard needed to cross paths, because to me, initially, when they brought, when they introduced Howard, he was kind of like the, it's like, this is the Ted Beneke of the Better Soul Salt, um, story, but, um, and the guy, the actor, um, which I'm spacing on, is a prog fan, too, which is great. Um, I can't even remember his name off the top of my head. Um, and oh, yeah, there's a couple other things like monkeys related here. Let me see if I can, um, um, where was it? Patrick Fabian. I'm wondering what he's going to do next. I'm curious, but yeah, he's a, like a yes, Genesis, floor. I mean, I, I didn't realize this, but, um. But of course, in the was it the third to last episode, the episode where they're doing the montages about the the guys where they're conning them and taking their identities, the Michael Nesmith. Well, it was actually a monkey song, uh, Tapioca Tundra, I believe. But it was the demo version that Nes did. That was acoustic. Was very um, sort of. I was just like my jaw dropped. Like holy crap! Of course, I had the the subtitles and it said Michael Nesmith, but that's actually a monkey's tune. It was only found on the the Bird and the Bee extended anniversary edition from like 2010. Only there. It was weird. And I guess because Nez had done it live with the Monkees, I want to say 2019, that version, or at least he had played that. So, um, yeah, my wife, who doesn't care for Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, of course, the Monkees a holic and Nez a holic, kind of felt like, what are you doing? You're ruining my song. And, of course, on in the... Tom, Tom, Thomas Schnauz or whatever his name is, he was the one who picked it. He's the fan, although he's not this fanatical fan like some people, but he's a big enough fan to know that. Um, he chose to use Going Down, the Monkey's Tune, in that montage they did in Breaking Bad when they were cooking the meth. So, And she, didn't, she wasn't as bothered by that. Of course, they also used Salesman in an episode of Young Sheldon a few years ago. So... The monkeys and Nesma stuff has been used on television, maybe more so now. And I mean, I don't know if, if it took N Michael Nesmith's death to sort of say, we have to do this, because I know that they were thinking about using it. He said in, in one of the podcasts, I think it was the, the Insider podcast, that um, 
having him pass away was sort of the the they they had to like you know so um too bad Nez wasn't wasn't alive to see it unfortunately but he did obviously see and you know Mickey of course Mickey Dolan's uh the Better Call Saw and he's I mean the the Breaking Bad episode where they used um going down but but yeah I have nostalgia like what happened was the first few seasons of Better Call Saul my nostalgia for sort of the process of watching it it's on AMC at the point that it started I I think it did it first air I don't remember if it was 2015 or 2016 um I know it first was shot in 2015 Breaking it Bad ended maybe Breaking Bad ended in 2014 um it was at least a year. It was a while because I remember when Breaking Bad ended, they were talking about like this show potentially, and it took forever to get any information on it. It was it was a long process. Maybe it was a casting thing and a script thing. And um, Better Call Saul, the first episode aired, um, and now I have one of my cats saying hello to me. It was actually it was February of 2015. Oh, for some reason, I was thinking. So they obviously shot it probably the winter or fall of 2014 so when did breaking bad actually end because i mean they split it up they shot breaking bad the ending of the filming of breaking bad was like had to have been 2013 but um so february of 2015 is when better call saul first premiered on amc Oops, I'm looking at the wrong. That was uh, January of 2008. I didn't catch on until 2009, so I was. I, I remember watching the first season of Breaking Bad, like when they did marathons in AMC after I'd seen the second season. I, I watched it sort of in reverse. Uh, September of 2013. Yeah, it was. Okay, so I don't think it was 2014, 2013. So it was not quite two years, but um, it's probably a good year before they even figure out what they're going to do, and you know, but. I used to do, yeah, okay, so February of 15, March of 15, maybe April of 15. My living situation was different. I was still living in my apartment that I originally shot videos. I started this channel in 2014. But I was at my wife's place, and the more our relationship progressed, the more time I ended up spending at her place, or her mom's place, really. So I would usually sleep over there, and then I would get up in the morning, go back home before I'd go to work, oftentimes. And so it was on, I think, Sunday, like... February, what was it? February 8th? February 8th was the pilot uh, of 2015. Let's see here. I go back. Yeah, it was February 8th. So what I would do is I, would, I either had it on, I think, because I didn't think On Demand was, it was, I had a DVR at that point. If you go back, I think it was, was it Mondays or Sundays? I know that the air times weren't always identical. I think Breaking Bad was on Sundays, but let's see here. February of 15, February 8th. That was a Sunday. I don't know. I mean, obviously, the, the last few seasons were on Mondays, but so that's probably what I actually ended up doing, you yeah, know, thinking about it. So I would Sunday night be at my wife's and wake up Monday morning. I would get home early enough before work. I would often watch Breaking, I would watch Better Call Saul because I wanted to see what was happening. I wanted to see what people were talking about it. Um, on the heels of, like, sort of the peak when Breaking Bad was sort of, even a year and change or almost two years later, it was still a just a fanatical show people were still talking about so anything related to it would be a big deal and would be a quote-unquote talker you know and um anyway yeah I, I have nostalgia for that that first season it was always fun that i'd get to like go home i'd get, I'd get home at like five o'clock watch better call Saul and get ready for work and go to work with kind of thoughts about the episode um but anyway i got uh a few people moving around, a few, a few of my, my furry uh, children. So, but yeah. So, what's your, um, what's your take on Better Call Saul, the finale? I mean, I thought that they wrapped it well. You know, they're at peace. Kim's character, sort of, for the most part, I went over some of the other things that maybe weren't quite. And they, the, the Jeff character, which I, I had issue with them recasting, but I guess they couldn't do much about that. That and the fact that Anna Gunn might have been able to come back as Skyler. Or for that matter, Walt Jr., the guy who plays Walt R.J. Mitty. Um, but um, I, I, you know, I thought it was um, it was a, it was a very good finale, and I'm sure it won awards. Cinema, cinema, cinematogra cinematography wise, Better Call Saul actually was ahead of, and they had the advantage of money and technology um, compared to Breaking Bad. It was really ahead of it. It was just very surreal and um 
very cinematic, of course, to, to, to use a bunch of adjectives people like to use. So, um, but you know, I mean, it's going to be a show I'm going to miss. I'm going to miss. I'm going to miss Ray Seahorn as Kim. Um, you know, I liked the El Camino movie, even though I thought that was it, it gave us some closure, but it didn't add a lot to the actual sort of post Breaking Bad um, story as much as Saul. You kind of once concluded that Peter Gould was quoted as like, when you're done watching Better Call Saul, you'll look at the whole timeline and Breaking Bad universe and story a, a fair amount differently. And the whole thing where where Walter White is the the, pro, the primary character protagonist of a sort to do with the meth and all this whole you know money and all the, the whole cartel thing and that whole part that culture in New Mexico. But Saul had a lot to do with his ability to sort of get to that point. Uh, Walter White. I, I, I agree with that to a point. I think given Walter White's sort of, you know, ability to find out how to do things, to learn and understand what is needed, what supply and demand, and he, in fact, he knew how to make this, you know, high, high, you know, percentage, you know, of the meth, uh, high crystal percentage, whatever you want to say, I don't remember what percentage it is, but uh, it was like 93% or whatever, clean, pure chemistry, um, methamphetamines. Why, 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 how he was able to, to do that, he would have still been able to... He probably wouldn't have been able to do things. He might not have been able to do things at the level he did, but you could have had a story. And my, my argument is that you could have still had a story with him doing the math. Now, ultimately, the way that culture works, obviously, it's shown in there, he would have eventually come across Gus, probably, which then would have, I mean... I mean, I guess if you didn't have Saul, what would have happened differently? You could have done it. It wouldn't have been as good of a story. And <clears throat> like I said, I think maybe um, uh, Mike is my favorite character in a lot of ways. The sarcasm and sort of the deadpan sort of comments and sort of decision making. But the Saul character in Better Call Saul, or in Breaking Bad, especially the, the Saul Goodman character, is the best part of sort of comic relief you know, satire, comedic sort of timing, um, you know, th th it added a lot to w very dark sort of dramatic parts. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's like, which character like more? And, you know, looking at Saul Goodman, Jimmy McGill, Gene Takovic, differently now seeing Saul, it's, it's almost like there were two separate characters really in a lot of ways. Uh, they're still connected, but really there's the Saul, there's the Jimmy character. We see his whole arc. I guess the thing you could do is you could watch Saul all over again until the la except the last couple episodes, then watch Breaking Bad, then watch the last couple. That would be the sort of start-to-finish chron chronological way to watch it, although the fact in Saul you get the flash forward. You have to do some editing. I don't know if they could if they'd do that. They, there'd be a way you could do that, like the fans' version of the, the point A to point C to point D, point E, F, whatever, in the whole timeline. Um, you could do that. But anyway... I did sort of go off this. I would be normally typing up some long-winded, epic post in my blog. But, uh, again, thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And we'll see you next time.